Hello everyone, welcome back to our channel. You are watching the series on molecular phylogenetics and in this video we are going to talk about character based methods part 1. There is another part to this topic and then we will be having our final video on molecular phylogenetics. So please stay tuned. Let's have a recap. We discussed that there are two types of tree building methods. One is a distance based method and the other one is character based methods. We discussed about distance based methods in the previous video and in this video we will talk about character based methods. So distance based methods are based on distance like pairwise distances whereas character based methods are based on discrete characters that is molecular sequences. This is distance based methods transform the sequence data into pairwise distances dissimilarities and then use the matrix during tree building. Whereas character based methods use the aligned characters such as DNA or protein sequences directly during tree inference. So if you remember when we, we were discussing the distance based methods, we were converting all the sequences into distances and using pairwise distance matrix we were calculating the distances and we were making the tree out of it. But there was one drawback which we came across at the end of the video that distance based methods usually leads to loss of sequence information. Okay, So here in character based methods we are not converting the sequences into distances but we are directly using the sequences for building the tree. So here there is no loss of sequence information but there can be drawbacks, there can be limitations and we will see what will be the limitations by the end of this video. So character based methods are also called discrete methods. They are based directly on the sequence characters rather than on pairwise distances. So when I say characters, it means ATCG, the sequence, you know, that is actually the characters. And if this is ATCG is basically for your DNA sequence, but we can also refer to amino, uh, you know, protein sequences. So we will be having amino acids there. So these are all sequence characters. When we, when I say sequence characters, you should definitely think about ATGC or, you know, the amino acids, the, you know, the one letter abbreviations of the amino acids, right? So they cannot, they count mutational events accumulated on the sequences and may therefore avoid the loss of information when characters are converted to distances. This is what I was discussing in the previous section, previous slide. So basically, if you know that whenever there is any mutation in the sequences, you know, in any sequence, it gets accumulated and is passed on to the generation, right? Accumulation of mutation means that the mutation you know, re retains in the sequence, right? Because if it because if it is mutating, it will remain in the sequence only, and uh, you know, subsequently it is passed on into the generations, upcoming generations, right? So all of these things basically are accounted by these character-based methods, and we are not losing any information because here we are not converting it into distances. Ancestral sequences can also be inferred. So when we are using character based methods, we can actually refer or we can go back to what would have been the sequence of the ancestor. So we will also perform one shot exercise or a method which will help us define the sequence of an ancestor. So that will also come up in this session. So there are two types of character based approaches. One is maximum parsimony method that is abbreviated as MP and the other one is maximum likelihood method that is abbreviated as ML. Maximum parsimony that is MP. The parsimony method chooses a tree that has the for a fewest evolutionary changes or shortest overall branch lengths. So we'll see actually what it means when we will discuss this method. Here, basically, we are using a principle called Occam's Razor. The theory was formulated by William of Ocean in the 13th century and it states that the simplest explanation is probably the correct one. So they are going with the simplest explanation and here in maximum parsimony, they are going with the fewest evolutionary changes or the shortest overall branch lengths. 
This is because the simplest explanation requires the fewest assumptions and the fewest leaps of logic. So this is actually that is why they are using fewest evolutionary changes here in maximum parsimony method. In dealing with problems that may have an infinite number of possible solutions, choosing the simplest model may help to shave off those variables that are not, that are not really necessary to explain the phenomenon. So we're just finding the simplest thing we can find from the haystack. By doing this, model development may become easier and there may be less chance of introducing inconsistencies, ambiguities and redundancy, hence the name or cams racer. By this principle, a tree with the least number of substitutions is probably the best to explain the differences among the taxa under study. So we are going with the tree which is having very less number of substitutions. That is the simplest thing we could go for. This view is justified by the fact that evolutionary changes are relatively rare within a reasonable short time frame. That is, this is very true that in a very short time frame, we cannot see much evolutionary changes, right? So that is why we will go for less number of substitutions and the tree will be formed accordingly. This implies that a tree with minimal changes is likely to be a good estimate of the true tree. So this is actually the theory behind the maximum parsimony method. We are going for the tree which is having least number of substitutions or minimal changes in a very short time frame. So how does MP tree building work? Parsimony tree building works by searching for all the possible tree topologies and reconstructing ancestral sequences that require the minimum number of changes to evolve to the current sequences. So we look for two things here, informative sites and non-informative sites. Informative sites are the sites that have at least two different kinds of characters, each occurring at least twice. Whereas non-informative sites are the constant sites or sites that have changes occurring only once. So let's see what actually these informative and non-informative sites are. You see a picture here. 1, 2, 3, 4 till 8 are the number of sites. Okay. Taxa are basically different organisms. So example of identification of information informative sites that are used in parsimony analysis. Now you can see that the sites 2, 5 and 8, they are highlighted as gray color, gray boxes. They are informative sites. Other sites are non-informative sites, which are either constant or having characters occurring only once. So you can see in first site, only G is occurring once, the remaining is A. So this is a non-informative site. But in the second side, you could see that there are A, G, C, all three of them are there in different taxa respectively. Then in third, we have T all over and just one A. In fourth, we have T, C, G, A, T, T. It is there, you know, you can see some, you know, differences here, but it is occurring only once. A is occurring only once, G is occurring only once, C is occurring only once. So this is a non-informative site. Next we come to fifth site. Here A, G, C, A, C, G. All are, here you can see all the characters are occurring twice. So this is an informative site. In sixth we have T occurring once. In seventh we have A occurring once. In eighth site we can see the differences again. So it is an informative site. So I hope the difference between informative and non-informative sites is clear. So using this, we actually start building the tree using MP method. Informative sites. To save computing time, only a small number of sites that have the richest phylogenetic information are used in tree determination. These sites are the so are the so-called informative sites, which are defined as the sites that have at least two different kinds of characters, each occurring at least twice. Informative sites are the ones that can often be explained by a unique tree topology. Non-informative sites. Other sites are non-informative, which are constant sites or sites that have changes occurring only once. Constant sites have the same state in all taxa and are obviously useless in evaluating the various topologies. The non-informative sites are thus discarded in parsimony tree construction. So whenever we are going to construct a tree using MP method, we look for these sites, the sites which are informative and the sites which are non-informative and the non-informative sites are discarded while the informative sites are further utilized for the construction of the tree. 
Once the information informative sites are identified and the non-informative sites discarded, the minimum number of substitutions at each informative site is computed for a given tree topology. How we do that? The total number of changes at all informative sites are summed up for each possible tree topology. The tree that has the smallest number of changes is chosen as the best tree. So let's see how it is done. Inferring ancestral character states. Okay. This is how we are going to see that how MP method works. The inference of an ancestral sequence is made by first going from the leaves to the internal nodes and then to the common root to determine all possible ancestral character states. Second, then going back from the common root to the leaves to assign ancestral sequences that require the minimum number of substitutions. So, inferring the ancestral sequence is a very important process and it's very important to understand this method step by step. So, we'll begin with the first step that is to determine all the possible ancestral character states. All the possible ancestral character states means that what will be the sequence of the ancestor and if you refer to and you should know that this step is basically we go from down to up that is from leaves to the internal nodes and then to the common root this is what we discussed in the previous slide so what happens here is that suppose this is a tree okay and we have the leaves here these are the leaves or the you know uh, the terminal nodes i would say so these are the different terminal nodes or the present day species in simple words. We have to determine the ancestral sequences, right? Now, if I'm talking about terminal nodes, this means this is with respect to one specific informative site. That is why you can see one single ancestral character, right? So one, one single sequence character. So this is with respect to one informative site. And when we are dealing with the entire sequence, then different tree topologies are created with respect uh, with uh, taking into consideration the maximum parsimony method. And then finally, the best tree is uh, formed. So this is just for one site, one particular site. So suppose the site is one. OK, there is a site one. And at site one, all these present day species have these characters a c g g and so on right now what we are going to do is we have to find out the sequences of the you know the immediate nodes to from which these common present day species have uh, evolved so this will happen consequently so let's just focus on it quickly we are talking about now this character that is c so this means it is coming from this node that is the common root or the root node. So here this means that probably at this site the root node is having a C character. Okay, but this is not decided. It's just an assumption. Okay, now we come to the next one that is A. The immediate node is this. So this can have an A at this site. It is an, again an assumption. Next we come to this. Its immediate node is this. So here also we can assume that there can be an A. Now the next one is C. The immediate node is this only. So there is a possibility that this uh, node has a C as well. We are not sure. We are just assuming right now. Okay. Now since this node is having C, then definitely the above node will probably having a C. Okay. There, so we are all working on assumptions right now. So let's see what happens as we move ahead. Now the immediate node to this is this. Here we will have both A and C because of these two A and C. Next one is G. So G has this node only. So now this node can have G as well. So A, C, G could be the possible characters at this position. The immediate node to this is this. So here we can have A, C, G again. Next we come to this character that is G. The immediate node is this, so we can have a G here. The next one is C. The immediate one is here, so we can have CG. And the immediate node to this is ACG, so we can have it here. Then the last one is A. Its immediate node is this, so this will have an A. But since it is also having these 
this as its next uh, you know its uh, descendant so uh, this can have c and g as well okay now the, the now above this we have the common node or the root node so we will have a c and g here as well so this is how we moved from the bottom till the top that is from the leaves to the internal nodes and then finally to the root node and we assumed all the possible ancestral character states or all the possible character states for each and every node as we moved ahead moved above actually okay so now the next step in this is to calculate the number of mutations this is what we did in the previous step we assigned all the possible characters at each node which is an assumption and now we are going to see that what will be the mu number of mutations at each step so in the previous step we moved from down to up that is from terminal node to the root node now in this step we are going to move from up to down that is from the root node to the terminal node and calculate the number of mutations at each step now since you can see that at the root node that is here we are having three possible character states a c and g so this means that we are going to have three types of tree tree topologies where at where each of these uh, characters will be taken into consideration as the root node that is for tree 1 we'll have a as the root node for tree 2 we'll have c and for tree 3 we'll have g as the root node and we'll respectively count the number of mutations so in the first case we have a as the root node and let's calculate the number of mutations i have already done that in this slide but we will quickly see that how this was calculated so here at root node we have a immediate to its right we have c which is the terminal node as well so now since from a to c sorry a has been converted to c so this means there is a mutation so we count it as one then uh, to the immediate left we have this node now this node has possible characters as a c and g so this means there might have been an a there cannot there is a possibility that it might not have mutated so we will consider it as no mutation here at this step then from this node we are moving towards the right we have a at this node uh, we are taking it a because here also we have a as one of the possibilities okay so there we uh, count no mutation then from this node again we move to the left there is already an a which is a present day species and there also we see no mutation it is from a to a okay then coming back to this node let's move towards its right we have this node here also we have acg as one three possibility so we count it as no mutation and write a here as uh, its possible character state for this tree and then from this node we again move to the left side we see that here we have c and g as the possible characters but we are taking a only here because uh, there might have been some mutation right we are counting mutation only with respect to present day species so here we can see that probably there has been a mutation here that is why we got a c and g here but we still don't know whether it's a c and g so we take it as a only so here we count another mutation then from here we go to c this is one mutation again from g to g we get another mutation so basically there has been a lot of mutations here at this branch then we move to this node from here we go towards right we see we there there is a possibility of a and c both so we we count it as no mutation but from here we move towards left and see g here g is the present day species and so we see that there is one mutation here then at this node we move again towards right there is already an a so no mutation towards left there is already an a possibility of a and c both so we count it as no mutation from this node we move towards right c and a there is no mutation towards left there is a c so we count it as another mutation so we have these many number of mutations so the total number of mutations comes out to be 6 for this type of a tree where a is considered as the possible character for the root node at this informative site so now we will see that what are the number of mutations total number of mutations when c and g are considered as the root node respectively and then we will see that which of the following uh, will be considered as the best tree on the basis of number of mutations present in the tree so the next one is 
where we consider C as the root node. So here we have again calculated the mutations, but let's see how we have calculated it. So from here root node we move towards right, there is a C, so we count it as no mutation. Towards left there is a possibility of a C, so we count it as a no mutation. Then from this node we move towards right, there is a possibility of C, no mutation. Towards left there is an A as a present day species, so we count it as a mutation, the first mutation. Then at this node we move towards right, there is already ACG possibility here for it to be a C so therefore no mutation and then we move towards left there is CG present so no mutation from this node we move towards right there is a G we count it as one mutation from this node we move towards left there is already a C so no mutation coming to this node again we move towards it right there is a possibility of A and C so there is no mutation we move towards left there is a possibility of it there is a G present here so we count it as mutation then from this node we move towards right there is a present day species having A so there is a mutation. We move towards left possibility of A and C both so we don't count it as mutation. From this point we move towards right we get an A which is a mutation and then from this we move towards left there is a C so we don't count it as a mutation. So the total number of mutations for this type of a tree is equal to 5. So total number of mutations for this tree will be 5. Moving on to the last uh, tree topology where G is considered as the root node. So we see this kind of a tree and uh, these are the number of mutations. So let's calculate it, calculate them together. So here we have G, from here we move right, we see a C, where the, so there is a mutation, we move towards left, possibility of a G, so we don't count it as mutation. From this point we move towards right, possibility of G, no mutation, towards left there is an A, which is a present day species, so a mutation. From this point we move towards right, possibility of G, no mutation, towards left, possibility of a G, no mutation. From this we move towards right already a G, no mutation, towards left a C, there is a mutation. From this node we move towards right, there, is a, there isn't a possibility of a G, so we count it as a mutation, towards left there is a G, so no mutation. From this node we move towards right, there is an A, so mutation, we move towards left there isn't a G, so there is a mutation. Then towards right there is A, so one mutation, towards left there is a C, so another mutation. So the total number of mutations for this type of a tree equals 8, which is a very high number by far now. So let's see now that what are the total number of mutations for each tree topology. We have 6 for the first topology, 5 for the other one and the 8 and then 8 for the last one. So since 5 is having least number of, is the least number of mutations actually, that is topology 2 having C as the root node. Therefore, this tree is considered as the best tree, where C is the root node or the ancestral node. So this is how we infer the ancestral character states and we count the number of mutations and we build the best possible tree using the Occam's razor principle that is the least number of mutations are considered and then the best tree is chosen. So there are two types of parsimony methods one is unweighted and the other one is weighted parsimony. The parsimony method discussed is unweighted because it treats all mutations as equivalent. So right now we have been dealing with mutations in the previous section and we see that the mutations are considered unweighted means that we are giving all the character state changes are given equal weightage. Okay, that is unweighted parsimony. This may be an oversimplification because mutations of some sites are known to occur less frequently than others. For example, transversion, transversions versus transitions, functionally important sites versus neutral sites. So there are some mutations which occur less frequently. Like transversions occur less frequently than transitions. That is, purines to purine or pyrimidine to pyrimide, pyrimidine mutations are more frequent as compared to purines to pyrimidines or pyrimidines to purines. So still, you know, in unweighted parsimony, we are giving equal weightage to them. So, 
Therefore, a weighing scheme that takes into account different kinds of mutations helps to select tree topologies more accurately. The MP method that incorporates a weighing scheme is called weighted parsimony. Weighted parsimony means different weights are assigned to the different character state changes. So let's see how this happens. This is a comparative uh, to show that what is the what is the difference between unweighted and weighted parsimony. So now if you see the first example, here we have G, G and G. Okay. From this is an unrooted tree, first of all. This is a unrooted tree. There is no root node, right? You cannot see a root node here. So if you move, uh, if you see the and you know the descendant of this G, G and G, we see there is a mutation here. At so this is a purine to purine mutation. Okay. Now we are not giving it any weightage. We are simply counted counting it as one mutation. From here to here, there is no mutation. From this to this, we see two mutations at the first and second site. So we count it as two. Then from here to here, we see one mutation. From here, we, did, we don't see any mutation. So total number of mutations comes out to be four. But if we give it, you know, different weightage and we, uh, you know, use weighted parsimony to calculate the number of mutations, then let's see what happens here. So from this GGG, we get a GGA. So this is a purine to purine uh, mutation. So that means we give it a weightage one. You know, you can see here comparison of unweighted and weighted parsimonies in the latter transitions are weighted as one and transversions are weighted as five. So they have assigned different weights to transitions and transversions. So here we are giving transitions as one. So here at the first step, we have a transition from purine to purine. So we give it, give it as one. Here there is no mutation. Towards right, we see that G is getting transferred to A, which is fine. This is a transition. G is getting converted, mutated to C. So this is a transversion that is a purine to pyrimidine trans, uh, transversion. So here we will give it a weight of five. So one plus five equals six. So we have a six, uh, you know, weight over here from this to this. The, mutant, uh, the number of mutations are given six value. Then ACG to ACA. Now GA is again a purine to purine transition. So we give one weightage. So total number of mutations equals eight. So here you can see the difference is how we calculated how we calculated the number of mutations for an unweighted uh, using an unweighted parsimony method and here we calculated the number of mutations using weighted parsimony method but uh, weighted parsimony method gives more accuracy as compared to unweighted parsimony because transitions are occur occur transitions occur more frequently than transversions so if we give equal weightage to everything then it is going to give you know false positive results i would say so let's move ahead now what are the advantages of maximum parsimony method it is intuitive basically that means it is based on assumptions and assumptions are easily understood right it is able to provide evolutionary information about the sequence characters such as information regarding homoplasty and ancestral states so if you remember what homoplasty is so at each step we can actually you know keep a check on homoplasty as well and we can able to we are able to infer the ancestral character states as well it tends to produce more accurate trees than the distance based methods when sequence divergence is low so we are getting more accurate trees here as compared to the distance based methods so in distance based methods we are actually converting the int into distances and using losing the sequence information so here we are not doing that but there are certain disadvantages of maximum parsimony as well. When sequence divergence is high or the amount of homoplasies is large, tree estimation by MP can be less effective because the original parsimony assumption no longer holds. Now, we saw a tree where only limited number of species were there. But if you have a large data set, that is divergence is high or maybe the amount of homoplasies is large, you know, it cannot be very much effective method like it will take a lot of time and effort and you know a num n number of topologies will be formed and then selecting the best one will become a you know a cumbersome task estimation of branch lengths may also be erroneous because 
MP does not employ substitution models to correct for multiple substitutions. So yes, branch lengths uh, can be estimated in a wrong manner. Uh, we were using different calculations and you know formulae for calculating the branch lengths in the previous uh, method, distance based method. So here it can cause errors. MP only considers informative sites and ignores the other sites. Consequently, certain phylogenetic signals may be lost. Now, which we actually you know kind of simplified it by selecting the informative sites and you know discarding the non-informative sites but somehow probably those non-informative sites might be having some phylogenetic signals which may be lost so probably this is one of the disadvantage of maximum parsimony method mp is also slow compared to distance based methods now distance based methods are quick you can just simply calculate make the make the matrix you know calculate the smallest distance and make the tree out of it and you get the branch lengths as well subsequently but here you have to look at each and every site and then you have to assign the you know you move up uh, from down to up and then up to down calculate the mutations so this can be a little bit slow and cumbersome task as compared to you know using distance based methods for constructing a tree so this is an end to this video and i understand that it has been a very long video and it has been long because uh, it was very important for you to understand that how the maximum parsimony method works and how we use this method the basics and the the background of this method was very important for everyone to know so this video was a, a longer one and character based methods is still not over we have another type of character based method called maximum likelihood method so we will be looking into it in the next uh, video which will be part 2 of character based methods so i hope you liked it you enjoyed it and you and i really hope that you understood the working of the maximum parsimony method and how we calculate the mutations so uh, I, if you really like if you really found this video informative please like subscribe and share follow us on instagram and you can write to us at the given email address thank you so much